Well, this series, again, this is week two. We started a couple weeks ago, because we had, we had Rick Fern here last week, uh, talking about the heart of praise and worship. Now, this is a foundational teaching in the life of a believer, and I believe God, we're, I'm trusting him, I want you to trust him with me, because I believe God wants to open up a dynamic of worship where it takes you to a new place. Because worship is not just singing. Worship is not something we do just to warm us up so that you know, we can get, hear the word. No, no, worship is a foundation. So we wanna go into that. I'm gonna review a little bit and then we're gonna get into some new, play, some new things. Where I really wanna go is I wanna talk a lot about this secret place of worship. Do you know Jesus, he went to the cross to prepare a place for you with him. And there's a secret place of worship where the plan and the purpose of God, the call of God on your life, everything that you'll do for him will be birthed in that secret place of worship. And the thing is, the Holy Spirit will lead you there. So we said this, a revelation of true worship is essential to the life of every believer. This is not a peripheral issue. This is essential. This is foundational. You and I were made to worship him. Because, see, it, it, because the intimacy that it births, it, it defines who we are. We are not a religion. We're talking about a relationship where the God of the universe, he made a way for you and I to become born into his family, to be moved from spiritual death into spiritual life, to know him and be one with him. And worship really helps you stay in that place. Show me a person who is weak in the area of worshiping God, and I'll show you a person who's weak in faith, who's not able to really walk in the love of God, who's not able to walk by the faith of God, who's not able to be led by the Spirit of God, and whose life is dominated many times by their flesh, they're living out of their senses, they're not courageous enough to stand in the midst of a storm that could take them out and know that God's with me and nothing's taken me out. Not only that, nothing can even defeat me in him. Amen? Whatever calling, whatever anointing the Lord is developing or birthing in you must be founded on true worship. I know for my life, God has taken me deeper in, in worship and it's revealed more and more of the plan of God for my life. It is, it's almost like as I go deeper in worship that it opens up this flow of the anointing out of my life that is just amazing. So don't try to do life without the anointing. Right? We need the anointing because God's called you to do things according to his ability, not your own. So Webster's, Noah Webster's original dictionary from 1828 defined worship like this, and I love this definition. Number one, it means to adore him. See, worship will bring a reality that this is not just, this is not just a religion. This is not me learning some scriptures so that I can be blessed. No, this is where I live my life is I just adore him. It means to reverence him with supreme respect. To honor him with extravagant love and extreme submission. Worship will take you to a place where you always in your life live the prayer of consecration. Lord, not my will, but your will. When that person cuts you off on the freeway and your flesh wants to just go, not my will, but your will. When, when God wants you to minister to somebody that might be a little intimidating or when he wants you to take your faith 
public, you won't back off from that. And that'll cause you to be light in this world, which is, it, it's what ministers to all of our hearts. So as we said last week, it's not a musical term. Worship is not a musical term. It's not fast songs and slow songs, right? But we do use music, and you just experience this. Music will support the worship process and will encourage the worshiper's heart. So if you notice, as the anointing was flowing out of these great men and women of faith, what was happening is that anointing was go coming out of you as well, and it causes you to open up your heart to him, to start to passionately pursue him. Because when you passionately pursue him, he'll respond to you. And when he responds, like right now he's responding. And I'm telling you, it's good. Because he's irresistible. He'll get you out of your flesh and into your spirit and take you places that you never dreamed you'd ever go. You'll see things about who he's made you that you had no idea that he placed that within you. And you'll be ready at every step for everything he has you to do. Oh, you might not feel ready, but the bigger that obstacle looks, or when God says, I want you to do that, and you're like, Say what? It'll help you tremendously. Tremendously. Worship is not a physical event. It's a spiritual experience. So this is very important. Now, uh, the physical has something to do with it as you yield your members, but it's always spiritual. It is an offering of the spirit of man it's not an offering of the physical man. So see, when I do this, I'm, see, it looks like I'm offering my physical man, but I'm not. I'm opening my spirit and I'm offering my spirit. Because they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now see, I'm talking about something we don't talk about a lot in church. Because we just kind of, it's almost like, you know, we got to have good music because it'll attract people so that we can entertain them and then we can hear this nice little sermon. But no, 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 we don't live like that. God wants to take you to a place. And he wants to deposit things in you. And he wants to stir things he's already deposited in you so that you live life on his level. What are we saying? We said this. Worship has a destination. There is a place. It's the secret place of worship. God wants you to go to this place. Your place of worship is, is designed for you. You know, we talk about it, and we're going to probably spend a little bit of time because we're going to rightly divide the book of John where Jesus is saying, I go to prepare a place for you. This is not just some mansion and estate in heaven. There's another meaning that's a deeper meaning. It's an abiding place. Jesus went to the cross. He became sin so that you would be made his righteousness. He prepared a place, a secret place of one-on-one, spirit-to-spirit worship for you. And I'll tell you, it'll change your life forever. Reaching God's presence Achieving God's audience is the first part, but worship occurs when God responds to you passionately pursuing his presence. And I'm telling you, that could happen to you. It gets to where it happens that fast. Where you start to be, you know, the thoughts are coming, you're in your car, you're at work, and all of a sudden you seem to start to get distracted at the world, and all of a sudden, if you'll but yield yourself and open yourself to him, as you're driving, as you're in a shower, as you're sitting, sometimes, I mean, you might be sleeping. Man, you want to get a good night's sleep? Just get out of bed if you don't fall asleep. Go somewhere and just spend time worshiping him. And see what happens. 
Because there's a secret place for you. See, this is a foreign concept to so many Christians. But we are last of the last day Christians. We're at the end of the church age. We are going to see an intimacy, an experience, an intimacy, and a breaking out of God that this world has never seen before. Amen. And God chose you for this time, for such a time of this. Worship is our response to a revelation of God's holiness. This is a foundational principle. There is no worship unless the Holy Spirit brings revelation to your heart of his holiness. And when you live with that revelation, you live a life of worship. I trust God all day, every day, so that I can live a life of worship. It changes everything. All things become possible. Everything. John chapter 4, verse 23. We said this last time we were together. John chapter 4, verse 23. But the hour cometh and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Well, what is truth? The whole world is saying truth is whatever you think it is. And that is a lie from the pit of hell. Truth is not of this world. Truth is God's word. His word is truth. So this is why when we sing, when we use music, we have to make sure that we're singing songs that declare what his word declares. Otherwise, there is no, there is no worship happening. Here's something that the Lord told me years ago at the beginning of this whole journey for me. And I'll say it to you, that we were formed. I'd write this down. This just, it just, it might not excite you as much as it excites me, but man, does it excite me. We were formed to personally, intimately, and regularly. Personally, intimately, and regularly, regularly, encounter the living God. You were formed, you were created to personally, intimately, and regularly, regularly encounter him all the time. This is the walk of faith. Praise, as we talked about praise just a little bit, praise is a physical expression or a physical offering to God. But here's the thing, and we said this briefly, God does not change, so there is not anything about our praise that will change God. Okay? Praise, worship, is not designed to change God. He does not change. Right? It says this, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. He never changes. If you're in a bad place and you're trying to change God, you, give yourself a break. He's not, even, he's not even making a decision to give you something. He already gave it to you way before you were born. Now it's just a matter of you receiving it by faith. So praise will change you so that you can receive from him. This is, this, is, this is so important because you think about it on the surface, you're like, well, this God, what do you mean he's created me to praise him? What is he, on some ego trip? No, you're thinking flesh. See, God is love, so God never, he never considers himself. Everything he does is for you and I. So he loves the unity of praise and worship because he sees the heart of an individual now where he can flow and move and help them in their life. That's why he loves it. It's awesome. Hallelujah. He never changes. Praise changes and praise edifies or builds us up. So here's the thing about praise. 
If you're waiting until you feel like praising, you won't. Because praise, see, we must deliberately purpose to praise God. We come into church and we're like, okay, we're going to praise God. But I don't want to lift my hands. I don't care. Body, we're lifting our hands. That's not my personality. Yeah, it is. It's just not your flesh. See, all these things, we, God wants, he wants to take us to a different place. It's always a faith endeavor. So praise is the physical reflection or the physical expression of the worshiper's heart. Okay? Now here's the thing. As you're doing all these physical things, singing loud, yelling, praising, dancing, kneeling, whatever it is, it's a, it's, it is to, or I should say it correctly, it is to be a reflection of your heart. But there's examples in the Bible where it wasn't. God says, you flatter me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. See, when you come into worship, God's not looking at your hands or your body or your mouth. Or, he's looking at your heart. It is to be a reflection of your heart. This is why you can't be concerned about others. Right? You can't be concerned. Okay, I'm coming into a service. I'm coming into a service and it's my job. I'm the pastor and I've got to be the worship leader. So could you imagine I'm up here worshiping. Come on, church. Come on. We got, let's go. Come on. We got to, we got to. No, no, no. No, when I'm up here, it's me and him. And, and over here, Tammy's over here. It's not me, Tammy, and him. It's, it's Tammy and him. It's, it's the individual worshiper. So, so don't be concerned. See, because if you get into this, you'll start wanting to work out other people's salvation. And you'll start thinking, I need to go out and I need to tell, oh, I, I need to tell everybody what they need to be doing in my church. And then I need to go out in the world. And I, hey, hey, listen, dude, you, you're, if you don't bow to Jesus, you're going to burn. That's not even the gospel. Right? The gospel is, hey, dude, God sent his son and he died in your place so that you could know him. That's the gospel. But see, praise and worship, it all flows together. Notice how I said everything flows out of a heart of praise. So we come, we do call it corporate worship, but really it's all individuals who are passionately pursuing God together. See, we are already one because of who we are. So don't ever talk about a fellow brother or sister in Christ because you're actually talking about yourself. Ouch. Let's, well, we'll keep going with this. So see, praise, it's the physical, it is to be the physical expression of my heart. It is, it is literally the horizontal reflection of the vertical connection. So if you watch me worship, you're actually seeing oh, something that's going on horizontally here. But the only, what's fueling it is my vertical connection with him. See, my heart is attached to him. And that's how I'm worshiping. God examines the heart, not simply the reflection. And what is he looking for? He's looking for fire. He's looking for passion. There's a fire in you. And the Holy Spirit will help you bring it out. And it'll change your life forever. I love this. Psalm chapter 95. Psalm 95, 1. Talking about it's an act of our will. It says, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. You could read it like this as I read it last time. O come, let us as an act of our will sing unto the Lord. 
Notice you're not being pressed to sing unto the Lord. You have to make that decision. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. It's an act of our will. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. Now jump over to verse 6. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. It's amazing. See, if we don't have that attitude, you'll start thinking your life is your own. You'll start thinking, well, I can read my Bible if I want to, or I don't have to. I can go to church if I want to, but if I don't feel like it, I don't have to. And that'll lead you down a life of living out of your flesh. Pretty soon, you're going to just be everything, you're going to be your own God. Because see, your flesh wants to move you that way. But if you live making a decision to sing, to lift your hands, to bow down, to realize that he is your maker, he is your life, it puts everything in proper perspective. So, now we'll get into some new things. Real briefly, I might go into this more in depth, but just I want to give this to you because there's seven Hebrew words that portray biblical praise. There's seven of them given. And, and they kind of are close to one another. The first one is Toda. I'm sorry, now that's a, I'll go over that second. The first one is Yada. Y A D A H. Yad, or I guess it would be pr probably closest Yada. Y A D A H. It means to worship with an extended hand. Yada. Then the second word is very close to it. It's toda. T O W D A H. Toda. It means to worship with an extended hand, but here's the thing in adoration. So, yada, I'm just worshiping with an extended hand. Toda, I'm going even deeper now, and I'm worshiping with an extended hand in adoration. The next one, it's, it's the Hebrew word halal. Halal, H-A-L-A-L. -A -L. We get our word hallelujah from it. And most people are saying hallelujah, they don't know what that means. So, so now we're going to really make you look good. So you're, here's what it means. It means God be praised. So when you say hallelujah, you're saying God be praised. But the word halal means to boast. It means to show. Here's one that the youth of life like. It means to rave. Have you ever been to a rave? Wow. No, that's good. Okay, Wayne, I need to, no, I'm just teasing you, I'm teasing you. But if you were to go to a rave, you know, if, if, if we had a Christian rave, we would make sure that all the youth signed a liability release form, right? Because a rave, you get kind of crazy. I mean, see, we will go, we'll go and paint ourselves half red with a big N on our chest, in white, with no shirt on, in 10 degree weather, and scream for three hours, but then we will kind of get a little bit, well, no, wait, this is, this is church. Man, I got to tell you, enjoy your peace and comfort down here, because I think heaven is going to be one of the loudest places. First of all, heaven's filled with kids. So if you're in church going, man, that baby is bothering me, just get over it. <laughs> get in your spirit, because wow, right? Halal, it means to boast, to show, to rave, to celebrate, to be clamorously foolish. Oh, yeah. Wow. Then there's another word, the fourth word, shabak. S-H-A-B-A-C-H. Shabak. For those that have to take perfect notes. S-H-A-B-A-C-H. There we go. 
but it means to address in a loud tone. It means to shout. Isn't that awesome? Then there's another word. It, it's the word, it's the Hebrew word, barak. B-A-R-A-K. Barak. It means to kneel. It means to bless God as an act of adoration, to kneel before him. It means to bow down. See, you're not bowing, you're bowing down in adoration. Oh God, I adore you. That's the Hebrew word barak. Then the next one is zamar. Z-A-M-A-R. Philip loves this one. It means to touch the strings. See, when he touches the strings, now I know I'm playing backwards, right? No, you're not. Is, that, is that about, are you left-handed? No. No, see, darn it. But when he touches the strings, do you know that something happens? There's an anointing. But this word zamar, you see, it, it, it's talking about instrumental worship. So the keyboard, the drums, the guitars, the bass guitar, all of these things, instrumental worship. Do you know all of these, the saxophone, all of these things. One time I was teaching and I talked about the sack butt. It says the sack butt. And I kind of made a derogatory thing about it. What the heck is that or something like that. And then a guy on our praise and worship team came up to me and said, oh, that's the trombone which I play, Pastor. Oh. <laughs> by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you'll be condemned, right? But all of those instruments are to be an extension, or we could say it this way, a reflection or an expression of the heart of the worshiper. This is why, see, somebody could be musically amazing, but so what? Because amazing to us is the anointing upon it. Right? We're just very blessed that we have both. Then, the last word is Tehillah. Tehillah. T-E-H-I-L-L-A-H. T-E-H-I-L-L-A-H. It means to sing. So all of these ladies that are up here singing, as you were singing, see, again, it's an expression. It's an extension of the worshiper's heart. If you look, the anointing upon Carissa is a little different than the anointing upon Emily, which is a little different than the anointing on Teresa, which is a little different than the anointing on Fran, but yet they all flow together as one. This is, see, it's, it's an extension. It's an expression of the worshiper's heart. So, the question is, can a New Testament believer use the Hebrew scriptures to learn how to praise the Lord? And the answer to that question is yes. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 102. The 102nd Psalm, Psalm 102, we're going to go to verse 18. And I'm going to read verses 18 through 22. Isn't there an incredibly sweet presence of the Lord as you talk about worship? I'm telling you, expect when we talk about worship to get your answer. Direction comes Faith is built, all of these things. Man, I think about Wednesday night service. Pastor Mark did a fabulous job. Amen. Did you notice when he was talking, there were some nuggets that he was dropping. That nugget from Mark 4, 15, did you get that? Where the enemy comes to take the word. He comes to make you doubt. See, he can't force and take it. He makes you doubt it. See, as you... As you live a life of worship, he'll never make you doubt the word of God because you live a life of adoration. 
All of your trust is in him, and it's expressed in rest. Rest, whether you're twirling around, whether you're running, whether you're screaming, whatever you're doing, you're still at rest. You realize that everything in my life is I already have the victory. That, that I'm going to finish strong. That I'm going to live long on this earth and finish strong, yield all my fruit, and I'm going to do it. I'm always going to be fresh, right? Everything I put my hand to, God is going to bring it all to maturity. Wow, no stress. So Psalm 102, 18, I'm going to read this out of the New American Standard Bible. Because it really, and every, and every Baptist said, amen, right? What a wonderful translation of this. It brings out, really brings out the Hebrew. Psalm 102, verse 18, it says this. This will be written for the generation to come. I don't know about you, but I'm starting to get excited hearing that. Because guess who you are? The generation to come. That a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. See, it is an honor to praise him and worship him. Do you know a person that doesn't know God can't? Because there is no revelation of his greatness. There's no revelation of his holiness. They live blind in the earth. They don't, they don't, they don't know. But you know. Because there's a secret place that it's, it's designed for you where God is going to talk to you about things that he won't talk to anybody else about. So specific. Because you're an original form. Although all of us are one, all of us are completely unique and different. And all of us are a different expression of our Father. Wow, I love that. This will be written for the generation to come that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. For he looked down from his holy height. From heaven the Lord gazed upon the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to set free those who were doomed to death. That was us. That men may tell of the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem, when the peoples are gathered together and the kingdoms to serve the Lord. See, this is speaking of a new creation, a new generation that would be created when redemption was completed. That's you and I. Keep going right to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. I want you to see something. This is the verse I wonder how old Jesus was when he opened the scroll and read Isaiah 61. And he saw the call that God has, his father had on his life. But look at what it says here. Verse, we're just going to go through a couple verses. In, in uh, verse 1 of, Psalm six, or of Isaiah 61, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach Good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Look at verse 3. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. What is he going to do for those that mourn? To give them beauty for ashes. The oil of joy, what, for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Wow. Why? That they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Notice it takes the anointing of the Holy Spirit to praise. Wow. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes. Have you ever felt like you just burnt down your life? God will give you beauty. 
He'll show you it's not over. He'll show you he's got something very beautiful for your future. I love that. The oil of joy for mourning. Boy, I'll tell you, I love this. In May, my mom went home. She departed. She went home to be with the Lord. That's a void that the oil of joy, whenever I start to think about that loss, I thank God. Oh, Father, I thank you for the peace that flows from righteousness. I thank you for giving me the oil of joy. And instantly, I stop thinking of how my loss is, and I think about her life right now. Makes all things new. And see, now, now remember, the Holy Spirit leads you into this. You don't have to figure this out. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. If you've ever fought depression, anxiety, and fear, God will just give you this garment of praise to where now it just, you lift up your hands and you thank him. Father, I thank you that I don't have a spirit of fear. But you've placed in me a spirit that has power, love, and it's causing me to have a sound mind. So I'm free from depression. I'm free from anxiety. Oh, I thank you for delivering me from depression, anxiety, fear, terror. I thank you that I'll never have another panic attack. See, he'll give you the garment of praise. You have to put the garment on. Notice he'll give you the garment. But you have to choose to put it on. See, this is what it looks like. Sarah, can I use you for just for a second? So, so Sarah's God. And so what Sarah's doing is she's holding out. Just hold this out to me. She's offering me the garment of praise. But if, if, see, if I live my life for myself, I'll just be like, where is God in my, where is God in all this? I, I just, I can't, oh, I, I feel so heavy. And, and, and see, all the time, yeah, bam. You know, if God was like Sarah, she'd be smacking me in the head. But if I will take it, thank you, Sarah, thank you. But if I'll take that garment, and then if I'll just go, wow, you know, well, it's a little... You know, I don't know. Gosh, I look kind of silly putting this on in front of anybody, everybody. But see, if I'll just do that anyway. So this is what this is talking about. See, this garment, did you notice how it fits me? Perfectly. Right? Do you know God? See... God doesn't give you, see, see I, I have a great amount of respect, a great man of God uh, that, that I learned so much from is Kenneth Hagin. Never knew him personally, but I still learned so much from him. But you know what? His garment of praise would not fit me. God wouldn't even want me to have his garment of praise because he made one for me. He went to prepare a place for me. And it'll take care of all heaviness. The Lord talks to me as a pastor. He talks to me about as a father, as a grandfather, as a husband, as, as everything in my life, travel light. See, because to put on the garment of praise, you got to humble yourself and cast the whole of your care once and for all on him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'll be all worshipful. I'll say, Selah. <laughs> Think about that, right? So let's keep going. You're in Isaiah 61. Turn left and go to Isaiah 43. I believe you're going to see a lot of these scriptures in a whole new light. Because all these scriptures are talking about, they're, they're, just, they're giving you glimpses of this secret place of worship that the Holy Spirit wants to take you. Isaiah 43, look at verse 19. God says this, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? 
I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Skip down to verse 21. This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. This scripture is talking about what happens in that place of worship. All of a sudden in your life, You think nothing is ever going to change in my life. And if you'll get over yourself and go into that secret place and let everything else go and say, Father, I am here to worship you. You're my maker. I love you. I thank you for my life. And I'm here today to worship you, to passionately pursue your presence. When he shows up, and he always shows up when you do this, All of a sudden, down on the inside, as you're you're worshiping him, you're going to hear down on the inside, Tony, behold, I do a new thing. Now, it's going to spring forth now. Isn't faith now? Shall you not know it? In other words, Tony, I'm going to bring it forth, and it's going to come forth now, And you're going to know it. I'm going to do it in a way that you know it. Wow. One on one. I will even make a way in the wilderness. God, I just don't know which way to go. I'm surrounded by trees. I don't don't even know which way is up anymore. It seems like every way I turn, everything is a disaster. No, 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 no. God says in that secret place of worship, I'm going to make a way in the wilderness. I'm going to bring rivers in the middle of your desert situation. Wow. Because look at this, verse 21. This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. See, God, the God of heaven willed that he would create a new kind of people who would be and do something new. What is this, do something new? This would be a people that would praise God a new way. That's what he's talking about. Praising God his way in spirit and in truth. God never wanted to live in a tabernacle built in the wilderness or in a building. It was all to point that he wanted to live in us. To be one with us. So praise is really a confirmation that we are on the way to the destination which we call worship. See, as you are praising him, it's confirming to you that you're on your way to this destination, this place where he responds. We call that worship. Praise is our response, okay, Remember we said worship is our response to a revelation that we have of the holiness of God. Praise is our response to a revelation of the greatness of God. I want to encourage you during praise, see what happens to you when you start going during praise. You start, you know, at some kind of an interlude, all of a sudden you just start going, oh, Great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. I'm telling you to bring a revelation because the Holy Spirit wants to bring that revelation because you get a revelation of the greatness of God and it causes you to praise Him. It causes causes your physical being to be a reflection of your connection with Him. And it confirms to your heart you're just getting so excited because you know it's we're, the next step is you're going to start getting a revelation of his holiness. Because worship comes as a result of a revelation of his holiness. And now, but it's confirming to you, this praise is confirming that you're coming to this destination, this secret place of worship where now he's going to make rivers in the desert for you. He's going to make crooked places straight. He's going to make all things new. This is 
And if this is, how often does this happen? Regularly, intimately, right? Personally, all the time. All the time. This is worship. Hallelujah. God responds to us on the basis of the attitude, the stance, the direction, and the focus of our heart. That's how God responds. See, he is, I mean, think of God this way. He's not like this. If they, if they do it, then I'll come. No, that's not the way God is. God is like, he, I mean, the God of the universe is ready to invade you. He's just, he's looking, he's like, look at that. Look at his attitude. Look at Rob's attitude. Look at the stance. His heart, his spirit man's opening up to me. Look at the direction. Everything about the direction and focus of his heart is on me. Now he's in a position for me to pour into him. That's the way God is. Every time, every time in your life, all the time. Praise turns the focus of our lives from us to God. If you ever want to change the focus of your life, praise is your answer. Without it, good luck. But praise will change the focus. I'm telling you how I was able to get over myself years ago, or I should say it correctly, how I was able to start the process of getting over myself, which I have to do every moment of every day, is I have to keep my focus right. And the foundation is not all the scriptures on faith I know or healing. No, 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 no. No, it's that he's, he's the one I adore. The stance and the direction, my attitude, everything is pointed towards him. All of my trust is in him. I'm not moved by any report I get in the physical realm at all. It means nothing to me because I know he stands behind his word and the mere fact that he gave me his word. As a result, I mean... This is all a byproduct of the fact that he gave me Jesus. I'm going to be okay. Like R.W. Schambach, he said when he was on the earth, you don't have any problems. All you need is faith in God. Before we can praise God, we must know his character and we must know his nature. So go back to Psalm chapter 9 as we kind of wind this down. Psalm 9 verse 10. Psalm chapter 9, verse 10. Before we can praise God, we must know his nature and his character. Look at this verse of scripture. Psalm 910 says this, And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, Hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Man, I'm telling you, you seek, you will find. You knock, it'll be opened. It's all there for you. So I want to close this out by reading to you the 23rd Psalm. Because this is such a picture. This is such a picture. It gives us a great example of praise. See, this is, this is a picture of praise because this gives us a picture. What, what really is praise? It is me celebrating. I'm celebrating God as my heart's new home. That's really what it is. I celebrate God, you are my heart's new home and you will forever be. So Psalm 23 is also a picture of our life on this earth. Why? Because we are to live a life of praise and worship to him. Look at this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In the Hebrew language, this means I don't lack and I won't ever lack. 
I'm not decreasing and I won't ever decrease. I am not diminished and I will never be diminished. Why? Because you are my shepherd. Do you see the worship in that? He makes me lie down in green pastures. Oh God. See, sheep only lay down when they're satisfied. You are the one that satisfies me so that I just lay down and rest in you. He leads me beside still waters. God leads me to a place of peace and rest. Do you see this as the secret place of worship? He restores my soul. This is why worship and praise is so important. It restores your soul. This word restore, I love it. It means to refresh with vigor and energy. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. Well, what is the paths of righteousness? Isaiah 54, right? Verse 14, in righteousness. This is my path. This is your path. In righteousness, I shall be established, fixed and immovable. I'll be far from oppression, right? I'll be far from oppression. Nothing will ever exercise hard control over me. This is my path, the path of the righteous, for thou shalt not fear. See, fear is always a result of not knowing about righteousness or failing to act on your righteousness. But who leads you in the path of righteousness is Jesus. Isn't that awesome? I love this. And from terror, for it shall not come near thee. No weapon, verse 17 of Isaiah 54, no weapon that's formed against thee, O prosper. Every tongue that rises against you in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Verse 4, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, guess what? That's what this earth is. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Verse 5, you prepare, I love this, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. See, you got to understand what this word prepare means. This Hebrew word, it means to arrange, to put in order. It literally means to work out all the details beforehand. So before you were ever born, God prepared a table. So as you're walking, what are you facing today? Sickness and disease on that table is your healing. You need finances, it's all on the table. It's all right there. Joy, peace, everything is on the table. God set it up before you ever got here. You anoint my head with oil. Notice what the anointing brings. My cup runs over. That means I live in abundance. Surely goodness and mercy shall, shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell. That means I'll settle down and remain. See, praise is celebrating God as your heart's true home. I will dwell. See, this is not just talking about eternity. This is right now. I'm dwelling in the house of the Lord, and I'm going to dwell in this secret place forever. Oh, my location might change. I'm going to go to heaven for about seven years. Then I'm going to come back to the earth for about a thousand years, maybe longer. I don't know. And who knows what else? But I'm always going to abide in the secret place. I'm going to abide in the house of the Lord forever. Hallelujah.